in the beginning was matter. And matter begot the amoeba. And the amoeba begot the worm. The worm begot the fish. The fish begot the amphibian. The amphibian begot the lizard. The lizard begot the lower mammal. The lower mammal begot the lemur. The lemur begot the man. So goes in a nutshell the theory of atheistic evolution. It is the idea that there is no supernatural creator. That this material cosmos, this world is all there is, all there was, and all there ever will be. There on the other hand is another idea. You may be familiar with it. It goes something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered across the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God divided the light from the darkness, and the light He called day, and the darkness He called night, and evening and a morning, day one, and subsequently those other five days of creation. The idea of creation that there was at one time and is today a supernatural creator who brought this universe into existence by speaking it out of nothing, creating it ex nihilo, out of nothing, into existence, putting this material universe into play by His will. There are modifications of those two ideas, but when you boil it down, those are the only two options. Either this material universe is all there is, or there is a supernatural creator responsible for what you see and ultimately what you are. Do we have evidence that would verify one of those two ideas? That would prove one of those two ideas? Well, if you listen to the atheistic evolutionists, they would say, oh yes. We've got evidence. We've got more than enough evidence. In fact, if you will listen to men and women like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is the professor at Oxford who is a militant atheistic evolutionist. And Mr. Dawkins says that it's absolutely safe to say if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, then that person is stupid is ignorant, is insane, or is wicked. But he says, I'd rather not consider that last one. You see, Dr. Dawkins says that if there's a person out there who doesn't believe in evolution, then that person is stupid, ignorant, insane, or wicked. It's ironic to me that for the last 20 years, surveys have been done in the United States of America and almost every single one of those surveys, when the question is asked, how do you believe this universe arose? What is the origin of the universe? 45% of the people who are asked say that the world was created by a supernatural creator in six literal 24-hour days some six to 10,000 years ago. That's 45%. Another 38 to 40 percent believe that God started the process and that there was and is a supernatural creator involved at least in the beginning. That's somewhere around 82 to 84 or 5 percent of the people who are asked believe that there is and was a God who was responsible for what is going on in this universe. Only 7 to 12 percent of the people who are asked believe in the idea that there is no supernatural creator and that this world came into existence without a divine being being responsible. That, to me, speaks volumes about Dr. Dawkins' statement. But now, before we go further, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you could take a vote on this and that the majority would rule. If it is the case that evolution and atheism is true, then it wouldn't matter if 99.9% .9 of the American population or the world believed that it wasn't. If it were true, then it's true. 
But what I'm going to show you this evening is that it is not the case that atheism or evolution is true. In fact, what I'm going to show you this evening is that the scientific evidence points overwhelmingly to the conclusion that there is a supernatural creator and that it is because of that supernatural creator that our universe exists. Now what we are going to need to do is look at some fundamental scientific laws. The first one we're going to deal with is the law of cause and effect. Now it is so fundamental you might not know that you use it on a regular basis, but you do. Suppose I were standing up here this night and as I, were speak, as I was speaking to you, let's say I had a book next to me on the table and you were listening to me in rapt attention and you were paying very close attention to what was being said and all of a sudden this book that was sitting on the table beside me shot across the room going 95 miles an hour and crashed into the back wall. And you looked up at me with eyes as big as saucers and you said, Kyle, what caused that? And I said, oh, nothing. It just spontaneously occurred. Sometimes, you know, books just spontaneously shoot across rooms going 95 miles an hour and crashing into back walls. Does that happen? No. You know that doesn't happen. Why immediately do you ask yourself what caused that? Well, because the fundamental law of cause and effect says that in this material universe, every material effect that you see has a cause that came before it and that was greater than it. Well, suppose I said, oh, I'm just kidding. You know, it had to have a cause. Of course we know that. But let me tell you what that cause was. As I was speaking to you, a large housefly about the size of a dime plopped his fat little housefly body on the edge of this book and catapulted this book 95 miles an hour to the back of the room. Now, do you believe that? No, you certainly don't. At least you shouldn't. Well, it's a cause that came before the book shooting across the room. What's the problem with it? It's not adequate. It's not big enough. Let me give you another illustration. Suppose we were driving down the interstate and you were next to a large truck and that truck was going about 70 miles an hour and all of a sudden that truck came to a screeching halt, did four flips and landed in the ditch. Well, you quickly pulled over. You pulled out your cell phone, dialed 911, got out and went to help the driver of that truck and you say, are you okay? And he said, yeah, but you got to get everybody off the road. You say, why? He says, well, they're everywhere. And you say, what is everywhere? He said, I saw it about 15 yards in front of me and I couldn't do anything about it. And you say, well, what did you see? He said, it was the meanest, most menacing, vicious mosquito I've ever seen. And it planted into the grill of my truck and caused my truck to do four flips into the ditch. And you get your cell phone back out and you call 911 again and you say, uh, we've got a little bit more serious head trauma than I originally thought. You need to get here a little bit quicker. Why? What's a cause that came before the truck flipping into the ditch? Certainly. But it's not what? It's not big enough. It's not great enough. Suppose I were to ask you a question. What is the standard evolutionary scenario that supposedly explains the origin of this universe? Here's what you would hear. About 13.7 billion years ago, a tiny singularity that they don't even really know what to call it, either matter or energy or something of the sort, smaller than a proton, a subatomic particle, exploded in what was called the Big Bang. Immediately after that explosion, something called inflation supposedly started launching all of the matter and energy out into the universe, bringing into existence everything that you see here. Now we need to ask a very pertinent question. Before we get into anything else, what we need to ask is where did that tiny ball of matter and energy come from? Now. What I'm telling you is that's the textbook evolutionary atheistic answer. When you ask those same people, where'd that tiny ball of matter come from? Uh, suppose we ask Dr. Dawkins. 
Do you know what Dr. Dawkins says in his book, The Blind Watchmaker? He wrote a book, The Blind Watchmaker, that supposedly explains design in nature. But in it, he has a paragraph that is supposed to deal with the original ball of stuff that brought the universe into existence. And do you know what he says? He says, well, I'm a biologist. And biologists don't really deal with the original ball of stuff. So I'm just going to let the physicist answer that question for me. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Dawkins. You don't have an answer for that, so you're going to let someone else answer that for you. Well, that's very convenient. But let's do. Let's let the physicist answer Dr. Dawkins' problem for him. What do the physicists say about where that tiny ball of stuff originated? Well, let's ask them. I want you to read with me a quote from a man named Dr. Alan Guth. Dr. Guth is one of the key players in the Big Bang inflationary model. He is one of the men who came up with this idea that is now accepted in most places. Here's what he says. The inflationary model of the universe provides a possible mechanism by which the observed universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. It is then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Well, you've got to get that original ball of stuff from somewhere. Dr. Guth, where did it come from? Well, it was infinitesimally small. In fact, so small that you almost want to say it came from literally nothing. Now let's frame that in a, a real life perspective. Suppose that you are there and I come up to you and I hit you in the face as hard as I can with literally nothing. We got a problem? No, we don't have a problem. It doesn't hurt because if you look up Noah Webster's Dictionary and you look up the word nothing, it says something that does not exist. Suppose I hit you with something that does not exist. We've got no problem. Aristotle said nothing is the things that rocks, is the thing that rocks dream about. Well, what do rocks dream about? Nothing. Something that doesn't exist, I just hit you with literally nothing. Well, let's ask, ask Dr. Guth. Dr. Guth, uh, what do you mean by literally nothing? That's what the Omni Magazine reporter asked Dr. Guth. He said, well, so how big was this pre-inflation universe? This infinitesimally small region that you just suggested came from literally nothing. He said, well, you know, it's amazingly small. Well, thank you, Dr. Guth. I, I should think so if it came from literally nothing. But watch what he says. Well, only about 10 to the minus 24 centimeters across, smaller than a proton, and also amazing, it would have only weighed about... Uh, 25 pounds. If I hit you in the face with literally nothing, we've got no problem. If I come up and hit you in the face with something I call nothing, but it weighs 25 pounds, do we have a problem now? You bet we do. You know, Abraham Lincoln once said, if you call a dog's tail a leg, how many legs does a dog have? He said four. You can call his tail whatever you want to. It's still a tail. You know, you can say that this tiny ball of matter came from literally nothing. But then when you say, oh, and that literally nothing would have been infinitesimally small. It would have only been uh, smaller than a proton. It would have weighed 25 pounds. Okay, well, where did you get that smaller than a proton thing that weighed 25 pounds? Well, how far back are you going to go? We know for a fact that material things cannot come from nothing. This is a common sense truism. Now listen to me, you understand it well. If there ever was a time where there was literally nothing, what would you have right now? Literally nothing. But you can look around and see that we've got something that's a whole lot more than nothing. Well, so let's go back to the law of cause and effect. In this material universe, every material effect has a cause that came before it and that was greater than it.
the evolutionists, we're not even granting them that first ball of matter. But suppose that they did have it. Just suppose. Although they can't get it, suppose they did. Do you know what that tiny ball of matter would have to explain? That tiny ball of matter would have to explain the origin of our entire universe. Have you ever stopped to think how big our universe really is? You know, used to they tried to count the stars with their unaided eye. Tycho Brahe went outside and looked up into the night sky and counted somewhere like 777 stars. Johannes Kepler, about 25 years later, came out into the night sky, looked up and counted somewhere around a thousand, just a few over a thousand. You can go down to your nearest retail store, buy a cheap, inexpensive telescope, look out into the sky and see multiplied thousands of stars. If you have access to one that's stronger, you can see hundreds of thousands. If you have access to something like the Hubble telescope, you can see millions of stars and you can look beyond those stars and see millions of galaxies and you can look so far that you can estimate that there are 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Now you say, well, uh, you know, 100 billion galaxies. Come on, Kyle, help me out. Help me understand that a little. Okay, if you wanted to count to 10,000 every single day to get to a hundred billion, it would take you over 27,000 years counting 10,000 of them a day. 365 days a year. That's a pretty large number. Well, you say, yeah, how big is a galaxy really? Well, we live in one galaxy. We live in the Milky Way galaxy. Suppose you just wanted to go across our single galaxy. Now this is one out of an estimated 100 billion. If you wanted to count to 100 billion, you have to count 10,000 every day for 27,000 years. We live in a single galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Every galaxy has at least 100 million stars in it. Our sun is a medium to small sized star. How big is our galaxy? Suppose you had a ship that would actually travel light speed. That would go the speed of light, which is about 186,320 miles a second or so, somewhere around there. That's about seven times around the equator of our Earth in a single second. Suppose we had a ship like that and you wanted to start on this end of the galaxy and you wanted to go just across our one galaxy out of an estimated 100 billion and you started the speed of light. We go every single year traveling the speed of light about 586 quadrillion miles, somewhere around there, I think. And we go for how long to get across one galaxy? Ten years? A hundred years? A thousand years? Fifty thousand years? No. A hundred thousand years traveling the speed of light to get across one galaxy. If you wanted to try to get to our near neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is one of our nearest neighboring galaxies, it would take you 750,000 years traveling the speed of light to get to one of our nearest neighboring galaxies. And that's two galaxies out of an estimated 100 billion. If you wanted to travel across our entire universe, it would take you 20 billion light years. We estimate, because we certainly can't look all the way across it. And how are we told that... This huge, vast universe came into existence. A tiny ball of matter smaller than a proton, 10 to the negative 24 centimeters across, that weigh 25 pounds of matter. When you ask anybody who suggests that idea, have you ever seen any matter or energy that could do that? No, we've never seen it. You ever seen an explosion that could? No, I've never seen anything like that. Well, what is the scientific evidence that urges you, that pushes you, that constrains you to believe in a Big Bang? Well, let's ask them. Let's ask the cosmologist, you know, the people who suggest this Big Bang and inflationary model. Let's see what they say. I want you to look at the cover of this particular New Science magazine, New Scientist magazine. Dr. Peter Coles wrote the cover story for this particular issue. Let me introduce you a little bit better to Dr. Peter Coles. Dr. Peter Coles is the professor of astrophysics at Nottingham University in the United Kingdom. Dr. Peter Coles has written several books including From Cosmos to Chaos and the science textbook Cosmology. 
Now, when you ask, who writes the books on this stuff? Dr. Peter Coles is it. He writes the book. Well, continue with me. Dr. Peter Cole's written over 100 technical articles on the Big Bang and periodicals such as nature and astronomy and geophysics. He has been invited to lecture at the Oxford Astrophysics Seminars. He's un he has an undergraduate degree from Cambridge University and a PhD from the University of Sussex. Now folks, this is not Kyle Butt's opinion on the idea of the Big Bang and the inflationary model. This is the statements, these are the statements that are made in Dr. Peter Cole's cover story of the New Scientist magazine. Well, Dr. Coles, what overwhelming evidence drives you, forces you to believe in the Big Bang? Well, let's see what he says. He says, inflation puts the bang in the Big Bang. Now, that's the title of his article. What put the bang in the Big Bang? What's responsible for everything you see? He says inflation did it. But now watch what he says about inflation. He says, well, there's very little direct evidence that inflation actually took place. He said, in fact, we still don't know what would have caused it if it did. So how confident can we be that inflation is really a part of the universe's history? Now hold on, Dr. Coles. You said that inflation put the bang in the Big Bang. But then he said, well, uh, we just really don't have much direct evidence that inflation actually occurred. And you wonder how confident we can be that uh, it really did occur. But then he goes on to say, Alan Guth cannot prove that this inflation actually happened, nor can he suggest a compelling physical reason why it should have. Within just a few years, inflation had become an indispensable part of cosmological theory. The only problem was... There wasn't a shred of evidence that inflation actually happened. I thought you were supposed to write for us an article where you explain what put the bang in the Big Bang. You explained to us how this happened. And you did. You said inflation did. But then you said there's little direct evidence. In fact, Alan Guth can't prove it. And then you said quickly it became an indispensable part of a cosmological theory. But there wasn't a shred of of evidence that proved that inflation ever occurred? Are you starting to see what's happening here? Uh, Richard Dawkins says, go to the physicists. They'll tell you. The physicists say, the physicists say well, uh, inflation put the bang in the big bang. It's got to be inflation. Well, can you prove to us inflation occurred? Well, no, there's really little direct evidence. In fact, there's not a shred of it. Continue with me. We don't know for sure if inflation happened. And we are certainly a long way from being able to identify the inflation. In a way, we are still as confused as ever about how the universe began. But perhaps now, we are confused on a higher level and for better reasons. You know what I think a more appropriate title would have been for that article? Confusion taken to a higher level. Because he admits we don't have a clue how the Big Bang could have if it did take place. And what we say, put the bang in it, we don't have it. Now listen to me. This is not Kyle Butt. This is Dr. Peter Coles with a PhD in this. We don't have a shred of evidence. Not only do they not have a shred of evidence that would suggest that a person should believe in the Big Bang or in atheistic evolution... There's overwhelming, compelling evidence against such. You see, because everybody recognizes that sooner or later you have to get back to a first cause. But you know what they know? They know that it cannot be a material cause. Because they have studied matter and energy so much, they know that it had to have a cause. It couldn't have come from nothing, but whatever caused it can't be matter. What did cause it? What could be a cause that came before this material universe that was bigger than this material universe? I think you well know. In the beginning, God. How do you describe God? The Bible suggests to us that God is all-powerful, almighty. That would take care of the criterion that He is big enough. The Bible also describes for us a God that is from everlasting to everlasting to take care of the criterion that He is before 
this material universe, the only logical, reasonable explanation to this universe is that the first cause is God. Well, someone will say, yeah, but the law of cause and effect says that for every material effect you have to have a cause that came before it. What cause came before God? Listen to what the law of cause and effect says. For every material effect. It's a scientific law that has been framed studying matter and energy. God is outside of that. You can't do an experiment on God. And every philosopher understands that an infinite regress is not an adequate answer. There has to be a first cause and it cannot be material. What is it? God. Now we need to look at something else. We need to look at the second scientific law that we're going to deal with and that's the law of biogenesis. Now the law of biogenesis is very easy to understand. In fact we start to understand it when we are three and four years old. It simply says this, life in this material universe comes from life that lived before it and that was of its own kind. Now that's not surprising to us but to people in the past it was. In fact people in the past used to believe in an idea known as spontaneous generation. Spontaneous generation was the idea that life pops out of non-living chemicals. In fact, they said, yeah, you want some scientific evidence that spontaneous generation occurs? Put a T-bone steak on your kitchen counter in the middle of the summer and come back in two weeks. What happens? Well, you know what spontaneously generates out of that. Maggots. They just pop out of the chemical process of the air hitting the steak. They said, oh, you want some more proof? We've got it. Take some old sweaty rags and wrap them around some wheat, stick them in the corner of your barn and come back in a month. You know what that will produce? Mice. They just spontaneously generate from the chemical properties of the rags and the wheat. Uh, if you want some more proof, take a piece of wood, throw it in a ditch that has some water in it sitting there, come back in a month or two, pop the bark off, guess what you'll see? Grubs, you'll see all kinds of beetles and worms and bugs, you name it. They just spontaneously generate. Well, in about 1660, a man by the name of Francisco Reed, he said, I'm not sure that uh, steaks spontaneously generate maggots. So he did a, an experiment. It wasn't hard. He took a jar, he put a steak in it, and he left it uncovered. He took another jar, put a steak in it, and sealed it. Maggots formed on the uncovered meat. They didn't form on the meat that was sealed. He said, voila. I watched flies land on the meat that was uncovered. I watched them try to get into the covered meat. They could not. And I believe that flies come from maggots and that maggots then produce the flies that grow into them. Well, they said, oh no, your experiments are wrong, see. Spontaneous generation occurs because the air gets into the meat and it's part of the chemical process. He said, okay, I'm going to add another element to this particular experiment. One jar left totally unsealed. Another jar he sealed hermetically, airtight, so nothing could get in. And the third jar, or group of jars, he covered with a gauze-type netting. And then he watched as flies landed on the uncovered meat, maggots formed. They tried to get in the totally sealed meat, no maggots formed. They tried to get in the netted meat, and maggots did form, but not on the meat, on the gauze. And he said, there you go. Flies produce maggots. They said, oh, all right. That's true. You're right. Now they said, do you believe that things don't spontaneously generate? He said, no, I just believe that maggots come from flies. I believe other things could spontaneously generate. In fact, not until 200 years later, when Louis Pasteur came on the scene, he did an experiment that once and for all dealt the death blow to the idea of spontaneous generation. If you walked into your kitchen and opened your refrigerator this morning and looked at the milk carton, you will see that that was pasteurized. The apple juice Container, pasteurized. Orange juice, pasteurized. Where'd that come from, that word? It came from Louis Pasteur in 1860. Did an experiment that showed that microorganisms come from previously living microorganisms. He boiled some meat broth or hay broth. At the time, that was what they were using to find microscopic organisms. They had microscopes that they could focus in on those organisms. Boiled it, killed all the microscopic organisms, put them in a special flask, put that broth in a special flask with an S shape at the bottom so that the air could come back in for all those people that said air is part of the process. But the gravity pulled all the microscopic organisms to the bottom of the S-shaped curve. And then he would break that neck off, allow the air just to go straight back in, and microscopic organisms would form. Since 1860, no 
person who has looked at the evidence has ever suggested that spontaneous generation occurs. In fact, let me introduce you to several atheistic, evolutionary, very respected scientists in their field at the time that they spoke these things that totally agree with that statement. George Gaylord Simpson, maybe you'll remember his name, he says, there's no serious doubt that biogenesis is the rule. That life comes only from other life, that a cell, the unit of life, is always and exclusively the product or offspring of another cell. George Gaylord Simpson. Dr. Simpson, where does life come from? Well, there's no serious doubt that it comes from other life of its own kind. Uh, Martin Moe says, A century of sensational discoveries in the biological sciences has taught us that life arises only from life. This man's an evolutionist. He's not a creationist. He's not fighting to get people to understand a supernatural creator. He is an atheistic evolutionist. But he says, there's no doubt here. A hundred years of experimentation show us that life comes only from life of its own kind. You know, I learned this very early. In fact, now bear with me, this story happened probably when I was about two. But it seems like the, the facts are in my mind very clearly. We were moving from East Tennessee to Middle Tennessee and we had a dog named Max. Her real name was Maxine, but we shortened it to Max for short, and she was in the family way, and she was going to have babies. And we brought her along on our trip, and she was getting very close to having those babies, so we put her in a bathtub. And the next morning, when we woke up, we went into that bathtub, and we looked, and there were eight of the most beautiful baby hippopotamuses you have ever seen. Do you believe that? Well, if you do, I've got some oceanfront property in Arizona. Throw in the Golden Gate for you. Why? Now, let me, let me ask you a question. Almost in all seriousness, you weren't there. You weren't there when that dog gave birth to whatever babies it had. Why would you not think ever that that dog gave birth to baby hippopotamuses? Well, well what if I changed it to she gave birth to eight of the most beautiful half-dog, half-baby hippopotamuses that you've ever seen? Would you buy that either? No. You know, as well as any five-year-old knows, that a dog gives birth to puppies. A cat gives birth to kittens. A giraffe gives birth to baby giraffes. An elephant gives birth to baby elephants. You know that. It's a fundamental, it's the fundamental biological law. Everybody knows it. Do you know what evolution says? That sometime in the distant past, life had to spontaneously generate from non-living chemicals. Standard evolutionary Theory on this, 4.7 billion years ago, a warm chemical soup was on the face of the earth. Somehow, a lightning-like energy source struck that warm chemical soup and caused the first building blocks of life to get together and form a single-celled living organism. Over multiplied millions of years of chance happenings, random processes, that single-celled living organism evolved into the complex organism that you see standing up here talking to you. Not only does evolution suggest that things spontaneously generated, but then it breaks the law of biogenesis again and suggests that multiplied thousands or millions of times, something had to give rise to something not of its kind, of some other kind. Uh, let me introduce you to a man by the name of Professor Robert Hazen. Professor Hazen, I'm going to give you his credentials. Bachelor's and Master's degree in Geology from MIT, Ph.D. in Earth Science from Harvard, Research Scientist at the Carnegie Institution of the Washington Geophysical Laboratory. He's authored 250 articles and 19 books, received a fellowship in the American Association for the Advancement of Science, one of the highest honors that a scientist can achieve in the United States of America. He is the president, or was at one time, uh, time of the Mineralogical Society of America, and he was a member of the International Society for the Study of the Origin of Life, ISOL. From what I understand, there are only 500 people, men and women, in the entire world from all countries that are a member of ISOL. This man is as credentialed as you can get in the scientific field. He did a series of lectures that I have on tape that are produced by the teaching company titled The Origins of Life. And I want you to listen to some of the comments that he makes during those lectures. He says, 
This course is unusual because at this point in time, there's so much we don't know about life on earth. He says, the origin of life is a subject of immense complexity, and I have to tell you right up front, we don't know how life began. He continues, how can I tell you about the origin of life when we are so woefully ignorant of that history? Did you know that if you pick up a middle school textbook, there is no hint of woeful ignorance as to the origin of life? Did you know they will put in middle school and high school and college textbooks their standard teaching on the origin of life as if it were solid in stone fact? And yet, a man with as many degrees and as much achievement in this field as you can find anywhere says, we're woefully ignorant on the subject. Well, thank you for telling us that. Because you sure didn't tell us that in the 6th grade or in the 12th grade or when we were in college in the textbooks that were being produced on the subject. But then he says, this course focuses exclusively on the scientific approach to the question of life's origins. In this lecture series, I make an, is, an, an assumption that life emerged from basic raw material. You do what? You make an assumption. Do you know what an assumption is? An assumption is an idea that you start with that you cannot prove. He says, I'm going to start with the idea that life emerged from natural processes, but I've got to assume it because I don't have the evidence to prove it. You know, using that type of thinking, we could just make an assumption that God exists and that there is a supernatural creator and that that's the reason life is here. Do you think that would pass? The evolutionary atheistic muster? Oh, it certainly would not. And the idea that there is a supernatural creator is far more than an assumption. But what... Dr. Hazen has is only an assumption. Now continue with me. He says, even with this scientific approach, there's a possibility that we'll never know, in fact, that we can't know. It is possible that life emerged by an almost infinitely improbable sequence of difficult chemical reactions. If life is the result of this type of happening, then any scientific attempt to understand life's origin is doomed to failure. Oh, it might be that it didn't happen this way or that we can't study it. And if you try to do tests on it, you'll never get to an answer. You know what he says about that? He says, well, if this is the case... If it really did happen that way, then there's nothing you or I or anyone else could do to figure out how it happened. I must tell you, that's a depressing thought to someone like me who's devoted a decade to understanding the origin of life. You know, it might be that I'll never figure it out. It might be that you can't do a scientific experiment on it to figure it out. But you know what? That's really depressing to me because I've spent the last 10 years of my life studying this stuff, hours and hours on end. So, Dr. Hazen, so what do you do? Well, because that thought is so depressing to me, watch what he says. He says, well, I guess it's not too surprising then that virtually all origin of life researchers adopt the philosophical view that life is indeed a cosmic imperative. We trust that it's only a matter of time before we know how it happened. You know, it would depress me so bad to think that I might not ever arrive at the answer to the origin of life. I'm just going to assume that it happened, and so are the rest of my colleagues, just because we don't want to be depressed, and eventually we hope that we'll come in contact with this idea of how it happened, but right now, we don't have a clue. You know what's interesting to me? What's interesting to me that not only does the Bible give you the perfect cause for life on this earth, in the beginning God... But in that first chapter of Genesis, on day three, when God made the flowers, the grass, and the trees, He said, be fruitful and multiply after your own kind. And on day five, when He made the birds and the fish, He said, be fruitful and multiply after your own kind. And on day six, when He made the land animals and humans, be fruitful and multiply after your own kind. According to evolution, somewhere in the distant past, spontaneous generation had to occur, and that organism that originally spontaneously generated had to over multiplied millions of years, turn into many different organisms not of its kind. But according to biblical creation, God laid down the law of biogenesis at the very beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two ideas as to the origin of this universe. In the beginning was matter. 
which we know is scientifically untenable. The only logical, reasonable, honest answer to the origin of this universe and the origin of life in this universe is the simple statement made over 3,500 years ago. In the beginning, God. It's volumes about Dr. Dawkins' statement. But now, before we go further, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you could take a vote on this and that the majority would rule. If it is the case that evolution and atheism is true, then it wouldn't matter if 99.9% .9 of the American population or the world believed that it wasn't. If it were true, then it's true. But what I'm going to show you this evening is that it is not the case that atheism or evolution is true. In fact, what I'm going to show you this evening is that the scientific evidence points overwhelmingly to the conclusion that there is a supernatural creator and that it is because of that supernatural creator that our universe exists. Now what we're going to need to do is look at some fundamental scientific laws. The first one we're going to deal with is the law of cause and effect. Now, it is so fundamental, you might not know that you use it on a regular basis, but you do. Suppose I were standing up here this night, and as I, were speak, as I was speaking to you, let's say I had a book next to me on a table, and you were listening to me in rapt attention, and you were paying very close attention to what was being said, and all of a sudden this book that was sitting on the table beside me shot across it is insane or is wicked but he says I'd rather not consider that last one you see Dr. Dawkins says that if there's a person out there who doesn't believe in evolution then that person is stupid ignorant insane or wicked it's ironic to me that for the last 20 years, surveys have been done in the United States of America and almost every single one of those surveys, when the question is asked, how do you believe this universe arose? What is the origin of the universe? 45% of the people who are asked say that the world was created by a supernatural creator in six literal 24-hour days some six to 10,000 years ago. That's 45%. Another 38 to 40 percent believe that God started the process and that there was and is a supernatural creator involved at least in the beginning. That's somewhere around 82 to 84 or 5 percent of the people who are asked believe that there is and was a God who was responsible for what is going on in this universe. Only 7 to 12 percent of the people who are asked believe in the idea that there is no supernatural creator and that this world came into existence without a divine being being responsible. That, to me, speaks the room going 95 miles an hour and crashed into the back wall. And you looked up at me with eyes as big as saucers and you said, Kyle, what caused that? And I said, oh, nothing. It just spontaneously occurred. Sometimes, you know, books just spontaneously shoot across rooms going 95 miles an hour and crashing into back walls. Does that happen? No. You know that doesn't happen. Why immediately do you ask yourself what caused that? Well, because the fundamental law of cause and effect says that in this material universe, every material effect that you see has a cause that came before it and that was greater than it. Well, suppose I said, oh, I'm just kidding. You know, it had to have a cause. Of course we know that. But let me tell you what that cause was. As I was speaking to you, a large housefly about the size of a dime plopped his fat little housefly body on the edge of this book and catapulted this book 95 miles an hour to the back of the room. Now, do you believe that? No, you certainly don't. At least you shouldn't. Well, it's a cause that came before the book shooting across the room. What's the problem with it? It's not adequate. It's not big enough. Let me give you another illustration. Suppose we were driving down the interstate 
and you were next to a large days of creation. The idea of creation. That there was at one time and is today a supernatural creator who brought this universe into existence by speaking it out of nothing, creating it ex nihilo, out of nothing, into existence, putting this material universe into play by His will. There are modifications of those two ideas, but when you boil it down, those are the only two options. Either this material universe is all there is, or there is a supernatural creator responsible for what you see and ultimately what you are. Do we have evidence that would verify one of those two ideas? That would prove one of those two ideas? Well, if you listen to the atheistic evolutionists, they would say, oh yes. We've got evidence. We've got more than enough evidence. In fact, if you will listen to men and women like Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is the professor at Oxford who is a militant atheistic evolutionist. And Mr. Dawkins says that it's absolutely safe to say if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, then that person is stupid is ignorant. In the beginning was matter. And matter begot the amoeba. And the amoeba begot the worm. The worm begot the fish. The fish begot the amphibian. The amphibian begot the lizard. The lizard begot the lower mammal. The lower mammal begot the lemur. The lemur begot the man. So goes in a nutshell the theory of atheistic evolution. It is the idea that there is no supernatural creator. That this material cosmos, this world is all there is, all there was, and all there ever will be. There, on the other hand, is another idea. You may be familiar with it. It goes something like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered across the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God divided the light from the darkness, and the light He called day, and the darkness He called night, and evening and a morning, day one, and subsequently those other five.